Good morning and welcome to the solution videos to problems D1 and D2 of the 2022 Meta Hacker Cup. In this problem, Boss Rob has given you n tasks which you have to complete, and you want to balance the amount of time you spend at work and time you spend at home. So to do this, you're going to do the first so many tasks at work and the rest at home, and you want to reorder the tasks in such a way that the sum of time you'd spend at work is equal to the time at home. Uh, as an example, let's say the tasks you have initially take times 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 1. And in chapter 1, the operation you're allowed to do is pick any two tasks and change their position. So in this case, we could change like the position of this 1 and this 3, and that would have a cost of 1. Now we want the sum of the elements before whatever query point we have here. In this case, it's after the first three elements. So we want the sum of the first three elements to be the same as the sum of the rest of the elements. Currently, that's not the case. So it's 5 here and then 7 here. But in one operation, we could pick maybe this 2 here and this 3, and we could swap them. And then we would have a sum of, uh, what, 6 on one side and also 6 on the other. So you can notice that it might not always be possible. In particular, if the sum of the array initially is odd, then there's no way of, of solving the problem. So we want to handle that case. Um, another thing that makes the problem a bit difficult is that between queries, the values in this array might change. So every query, you'll do two things. One, you'll change the value. You might not change it, but you'll set the value of some position to a new number. And then also, you have to answer this query for any particular split point. Um, so yeah, that was the split point here, but we might have a split point in a different position, right? Maybe we have a split point um, that up here, we have it here. So now we need both the left and the right to have a sum of six. And the only way of doing that is having two threes on one side. So we could swap these two. That would work. This takes two operations. All right, so how do we actually solve this problem? Well, it turns out that uh, we don't really care too much about the order of the array. We only really care about what kinds of things are on the left side and the right side of whatever split point we're given. So if we know how many 1s, 2s, and 3s are on the left and how many 1s, 2s, and 3s are on the right, that's all the information we need in order to solve the problem. Um, in particular, we're never going to swap two elements on the same side. It doesn't make any sense. We might as well just not do it. We save an operation. Okay, so yeah, how do we go about doing this? Well, first we can like calculate the sum on each side. We could do this with cumulative sums, but the problem is we have to do updates. So in order to handle the updates, we'll use some sort of Fenwick tree, and we can store the sum of like every possible range that we can query in log n. So yeah, we can use Fenwick trees or segment trees, but we'll query a particular range in log n, and that'll tell us the sum. We can also do a similar thing, but instead of storing a Fenwick tree of this, we can store three different Fenwick trees. One for the ones, one for the twos, and one for the threes. So these are the three arrays that we would have a Fenwick tree of. Uh, this is all of the positions of a one, this is all the positions of a two, and then all the positions of a three. And this lets us see, in a certain range, how many ones, twos, and threes are there. And that's all we need to solve the problem. So once we have the counts of the 1s, 2s, and 3s, we just need to do a little bit of logic in order to effectively count how many moves it would take in order 1. Uh, and what we can first do is consider, well, if we have a long way to go, it's probably beneficial to take 3s from the bigger side and switch them with 1s from the smaller side. And that'll decrease the total sum by 2 if we do that, or actually by 4. It'll decrease the difference by 4. Um, if we move threes and ones after we've tried to do that, we can also switch twos and ones, and then finally we can switch threes and twos. And those are the three ways of decreasing the difference. Decrease, or switching a two with a one will change the difference by two, and switching a three with a two will also change the difference by two. And then threes and ones change it by four. And the reason is, like, if we do a two and a one, this goes from a two to a one, but this goes from a one to a two. So it's not a change of one, it's actually a change of um, and that also does a good job of explaining how if the initial sum is odd, you can only change the sum by an odd amount, so it's never going to end up working. All right, so that's the idea to D1. It ended up being, in my opinion, a, a little bit easier to code than D2. Um, D2 is a bit tricky, so what's the difference between the two chapters? Well, the first part is that instead of having 1s, 2s, and 3s, we only have 1s and 2s. So we might have something like this. Uh, we still have the same type of query, though. We're given some particular bound like this, and we want to say, how many operations does it take for the left sum to equal the right sum? 
In the other version, this would just take one move because we can swap any two elements. But in this version, we're only allowed to swap adjacent elements. So we can swap these two and we can still do it in one move. You can imagine it's a little bit more tricky though. It might take more than that. If we have the two here and the one here, it's still possible, it just takes two moves. So first we would do this swap and then we would swap these two. And we'd be left with two, two, one, um, two, one, or sorry, two, two, one. After the first swap, we would have a, a one here and a two here. And then we'd swap these two again. So yeah, that's the, the problem statement. How do we go about doing it? Well, the key observation here is since there are only ones and twos, there aren't any threes, all we have to consider is moving twos and ones from one side to the other. And uh, this winds up being quite a bit easier because when we're given the query, we can do the same sort of trick with the Fenwick tree to see exactly how many twos do we have to move from one side to the other. All right, so we know how many twos we have to move from one side to the other. Uh, which twos should we move and what will be the cost for doing it? Because keep in mind, we're only allowed to move adjacent elements in this problem, not any two elements. So if we have something like this, well, we know this two has to go to this side. And we want to pick this two because it's the rightmost two. It'll take the least time to get to the other side. And we want to pick this one and go to the left side. Um, this is a pretty simple example, but let's look at maybe a more complicated one. So let's say we have elements on the left side in these positions here with circles. And we need to move them over to this, the other side. And then there are three elements we need to move, so they need to switch places with, with three other elements. So maybe we have these elements here. All right, so how do we do this? Well, what we want to calculate is the total number, we're going to do, we're going to do this in two steps. The first step will get us something that looks like this. We'll move all of these circles close to the center, and then we'll move all of these circles close to the center. That's pretty easy. Once we do that, we can just swap each of these. But that's an easier thing to calculate, because it's a very simple case. So this is, this is how I solved it anyway. Um, OK, so what is the cost to move these things to the center like this? Well, for each one of these circles, we want to count how many x's are to the right of it. So this will cost $1. This one will cost $2 because it'll have to replace these two x's. And this one will cost $2 as well. This one will be free, so we'll say $0. This one will be $2, and this one will be $3. We want the sum of both of these. And then once we're here, we need to know the cost of flipping it. So we have three things. So we'll have to, we'll, like, every time we make a move, we remove an inversion. So the total number of inversions here is just 3 times 3. So this will just cost three times three dollars, and that's equal to nine dollars. So the total cost is two plus two plus one plus two plus three plus nine. And you can add that up if you'd like. Um, okay, that's fine and all, but we haven't actually solved the problem because we have to do this a bunch of times with a bunch of queries. And in addition to doing that, we have updates. So we have to find a way of doing this fast, and it's kind of a data structures problem where we have to figure, all right, how can we make the tools we need in order to be able to handle this? And uh, here's what we can do. So the, the last part is easy. We know how many things are on each side. It's just squaring a number we know how to do that. The hard part is this first part here. How do we like calculate the number of moves for each of these things? Also, there might be other things in this array. So we have to very quickly figure out what is like the suffix in the prefix here, where we move, say, all of the twos on this side and all of the ones on this side. How do we find that suffix? So actually, we can do all of this with Fenwick trees if we're pretty careful with it. Um, what we need to do here is if we know how many, let's say we're looking at ones here, so I'm going to replace these with ones. Let's say we need to move three ones to the other side. We can find which prefix we're interested in by doing like finding the kth one bit on a Fenwick tree that has zeros in all the places where there are twos and ones in all the places where there are ones. So we have a Fenwick tree of like the indices of ones and we want to find the kth one. You can also do this with segment trees. It's not too bad, um, but Fenwick trees is a little bit faster if you're into that. So yeah, we can find this index by using get kth on a Fenwick tree. We can do the same thing with this index here. So 
If each of these are the twos, we can look at the twos fenwick tree. There might be other twos over here, but we don't need them. So we want to find, okay, there are five twos in this half of the array. We want to move these last three, so we need to find the index of this third two. So we'll get kth from the beginning, and we'll get the index of this two here. All right, so now we've found these two ranges, and we need to do some, some interesting things. So on the left side, we needed to see like, okay, this has a cost of zero, this has a cost of two, this has a cost of three. That seems like we might need to iterate through all of the, all of the ones, which would be pretty slow. So we want something faster than that. How do we do that? Well, we can store another type of bit. So we've got one bit for the actual sum. We have another bit for where the ones and twos are. We can make a third bit, when I say bit, I mean Fenwick tree. We can have a third Fenwick tree for uh, calculating this part really fast. And here's how that works. We're gonna store a like plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four value, where the number you add is your index. So this will be like plus zero, this will be plus one. This one's a one. So in the Fenwick tree of two is where we do this, we're gonna just keep a zero here. This one will be a plus two. Or sorry, plus three, I mean. So this will be a zero. We'll just leave it blank. This will be a plus three, because it's index three. Um, and so on, right? So we'll have this array for the twos, and we'll also have an array for the ones. So this will be a plus two for the ones, and then I'll keep going here. Three, four, this will be, or this will be plus uh, four, plus five, six, seven, plus eight, nine, and plus 10. So now we can do range sums on this array, and it winds up being very helpful, because if we look at this part here, and we subtract five from each of these, it winds up being exactly what we want. Yeah, okay, it winds up being close to what we want. So we, <laughs> we're off by a certain amount, but I'll show you how much we're off by, and we can also calculate that in order one. So this will give us zero, this will give us three, and this will give us five. But we're off by zero, one, and two. Zero plus one plus two. So we can also subtract that, because that's just like n choose k, and the reason we're off by that is we're saying this node has to jump over this other one, but it doesn't actually, so we can save that at the end. So if we do that, this part is just minus five, which is this index here, times a constant, and this is just a range sum in a bit. So we can do both of these things, or a Fenwick tree. Bit stands for binary index tree. That's why I keep saying bit when I mean Fenwick tree. Um, yeah, so we can do both of these in um, log time, order one in log n time. And then for this, we need to subtract zero plus one plus two and so on. And this is just n times n minus one over two. What's going on here? So doing that, we can calculate this left side here. And the right side is, is very similar. Um, it's a little, you gotta work it out on paper, make sure you get it right. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very similar. So we do the same sort of thing and we can get the solution here. Um, for the right side, and then we just multiply in the, the number of ways of doing the middle. So it's kind of an evolved solution, but not too bad, I would say. Just a little, a little math. One of the things you want to watch out for is usually when people have Fenwick trees, they store them as integers, but when you do this, this one here where you do plus one, plus two, plus three, you want to make sure you store them as longs. And the reason for that is that inside the Fenwick tree, you store cumulative sums. So the sum of n values of order n can be n squared, so you're going to need to use longs internally. Uh, and there are a lot of other places where if you're not careful, you can overflow. So that's probably why you failed if you managed to pass the validation data but somehow fail the full data. It's probably because you forgot to cast to a long somewhere. All right, that was work-life balance. I hope you enjoyed the problem. I thought it was kind of clever. And uh, if you were in the top 500 finishers, I will see you in round three where you're competing to get to world finals and for a top 200 badge on the side of your shirt. If you weren't in the top 500 finishers, but you were in the top 2000, then you will get an email in the next several days about how you can claim your t-shirt. And you can also go to the Hacker Cup webpage and on your profile, there will be information on how you can claim the t-shirt that you won if you were in the top 2000. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the round and I hope you have a great day.